to us. And I really felt encouraged by what he was sharing last night. How many were encouraged by that? You know, I think that fresh start um, word, you know, I, I want to believe that's not just for believers, but that's for our nation. I mean, man, wouldn't that be great? And so we're just going to receive that word. Uh, I think just on behalf of the entire nation, God, you're going to put us in the right direction. And it's going to be a fresh start. And, you know, one of the things that he shared was a lot of times that needs to start not, you know, of course, we don't have a White House, Bobby, but not in the White House, but in the church house. And I think, you know, that was such an important word for us. And so we're so blessed um, to have Bobby Connor minister this morning. And so let's just stand. Let's give him a warm, uh, warm welcome as he comes today. There we go. No, oh, yeah. all right. We had a little sound trouble, but everything's going to be okay. Jesus didn't even have one of these things. He just got in a boat, pulled out a little bit, and his voice covered the whole region. Aren't you glad that uh, we're Christians? I mean, listen, think about this. You didn't choose him. He chose you. I actually chose you in eternity past to live in the present to forge the future. You do understand we're forging the future that our grandchildren will live in. And we need to hand this thing off better than we found it, don't you think? And so we've got to really clean up our act. That's right. See, without holiness, no person will see the Lord. I don't know where we got this thing that holiness is optional. Pursue peace and holiness, for without holiness, no person will see the Lord. I love the Bible. It never asks a question without releasing an answer. Psychology and all that other stuff raises a lot of questions and no positive answers. But the Bible never asks a question without releasing an answer. Here it is. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Hands talk about action. Heart talks about attitude. And uh, God wants you to have clean hands and a pure heart. And so we need to get into the courts of heaven. And uh, that's what it says. It said, if you'll tend to my, my, my things I tell you to do, uh, I'll give you a place to walk among those that are standing here. That's pretty wild, isn't it? If it wasn't in the Bible, it, it, I, I wouldn't even hardly believe it. Now, uh, I, I, I want to talk to you about the shepherd's rod. We get a lot of orders from Canada for the shepherd's rod, and it costs more to mail it than it does to buy it here. It, 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 it's a, to mail from Texas to Canada costs more than the, the whole book. And so uh, it'd be a bargain for you if you want to buy some for your friends now, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm serious because it, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. But anyway, the shepherd's rod. For, for 28 years on the Day of Atonement, I've had this encounter with Jesus Christ. He tells me some of the things that's going to happen in the future. I write in a book called The Shepherd's Rod. And you, you can study it. My wife has, we have archives all the way back to uh, for 28 years. And see, here's what the Bible said, Amos 3, 7. Surely, absolutely, God will not do a single thing without first revealing what he's going to do to his servants, the prophets. That's what it says. And so uh, he tells the prophets, and then the prophets prophesy, and God brings it to pass. It says they're, they're called into being by the prophetic word. That's what it says. And before today, you've never heard of them because you would go, I ah, already knew that. No, God's doing a new thing now. I promise you that. And I'm telling you, he said, you better prepare the people. We've never been where we're going now. And uh, I, I'm excited about the opportunity just to share with you about what God said he's going to do. He said, I'm going to show up and show off in such a magnitude, my people are going to be awestruck. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. Because I told you last night, we're way too familiar with the God we barely know. But he's about to reintroduce himself. The holy reverential fear of the Lord is coming back to the body of Christ. And we desperately need it. We need it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You say, I ain't afraid of God. Oh, listen, I'm more afraid of God than I am the devil. I can rebuke the devil. But you understand that? Now, listen, uh, we have to watch out because we've been going through some terrible theological things in the church. This super seeker friendly, it doesn't matter. Now, God understands that you're human and that you're frailty. And uh, just go ahead and sin. He'll forgive you. That ain't in the Bible. The Bible said if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of that sin, there remains no more sacrifice for that sin, but a fearful looking of fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. Does that sound like God? God told me, he said, you better tell my people I'm not near as easy to get along with as some preachers have made me out to be. Look out now. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. And that's the only kind we've got. You know, some people have a little plastic one you can put out in the yard. That won't, that won't hurt you. You know what I mean? A living God. Say living God. 
And God, we're going to have to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether they're good or bad. And so I want us to clean up our act, don't you think? Come out from among them and be you separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. I will be your God. You will be my sons and daughters, declares the Lord God Almighty. You say, well, Bobby, I, I'm, I've checked myself out. I'm all right. Well, you're inadequate in checking yourself out. You need to pray the same prayer David prayed. Search me, O God, and try me. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in a way that's eternal and everlasting. Ask God to search you, okay? Oh, man. I listen. Uh, he'll show you. Because they can be some things in your life you don't even know that's there. The Bible said it's the little bitty foxes that swallow swallow the vines. So ask God to search you. And then when he puts his finger on something, instead of trying to cover it up, quickly confess it. The Bible said if we'll confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. He said he'll put it as far as the east is from the west, never to remember it again. One translation says he will drop it in the sea of his forgetfulness. Aren't you glad? Isaiah 1 18 says, come on now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. Isn't that cool? God can forgive you and he forgets about it. He puts it as far as the east is from the west, never to remember it again. So if you keep being badgered by your past, guess who's bringing it up? Not God, the devil. And we need to understand when you confess your sins and forsake your sins, it's as though it never happened. Uh, Aren't you glad? I'm thankful for that. Now, God wants us to be pure and clean. You say, well, Bobby, uh, I'm having some struggles. That's one of the things we need to do. We need to learn how to, to focus on the Lord and cast all of our care upon him. Here's what Jesus said, Matthew, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. I'm meek and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. And see, you, the, a lot of people go, well, you know, uh, I'm under a lot of pressure, and a lot of stress, and, you know, I take some anxiety medicine. God told me to tell you, you cannot medicate anxiety. You have to repent of it. Because the Bible says, be anxious for nothing. But in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, I'm talking fast. It's that coffee. Plus, I, used, I talk real fast because I used to buy television time, and I'm cheap. So you know, you know, so I try to talk if I talk real fast, but since Pastor Johnny's paying for this, I can just slow down. <laughs> yeah, I do talk fast, honestly, but I, I got a lot to say, and and so uh, I, I I do. I really I want you to get into the Word of God and let the Word of God get into you. It's it's a weapon. It is taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and the Word of God will separate between the real and the and the fake. And that's why it says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We've got to get into the Word of God and let the Word of God get into us. I'll tell you about the Word of God. It's not, it's not print on paper. It's Jesus. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father. And so you'll never be used of God in the dimension God wants to use you if you're shallow in the Word of God. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Now, we got grandchildren and all this. And so the Lord said, I want you to teach your grandchildren uh, the Bible. I said, great. What, what verse do you want me to teach them? He said, Psalms uh, 119, uh, 9, 9 through 11 says, Wherewithal shall a young... Here, here's that verse in the King James. You ready? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought after thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Now, you think some little Texas rednecks are going to memorize that? (laughs) Sounds like Shakespeare, don't you think? But I can call any one of them and, and say, how can a young person live a clean life? And they'll scream by obeying the Bible. See, the same thing, but in a vernacular they could receive. And I was, I was telling people, we got to quit trying to put the hay so high the cows can't reach it. See, a lot of people are trying to show off their intellectuality. Paul said, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. My speech and my preaching was not with eloquent words of man's wisdom, but in a demonstration of God's power so that your faith would not stand in the wisdom of man, but rather in the power of God. Now, Paul could have wowed you. He, he was tutored by Gamal, and he, he could have talked about all of that, but he said, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That, see, we've got to stay on point, don't you think? Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll do what? Draw all men unto myself. The Lord told me one time, listen, pastors, the Lord told me 
The highest form of treason in ministry is to take the gifts God gives us to win the people to Christ and use those gifts to win the people to ourselves. He said that's the highest form of treason in ministry. Wow. Isn't that something? We've got to be careful, hadn't we? So this means yes, unless you're in India. <laughs> you, you ever been to India? Is this the way to Bombay? Is that the way to Bombay? I've never figured that out, but uh, uh, apparently they can communicate that away. I was over in India once, and a little bitty Indian lady, old granny kind of Indian lady, she comes up and she said, uh, you like her, ma'am? You like her, curry? ma'am? Uh, do you like curry? That's what she was saying to me. And I go, yes, I like curry. She said, curry chicken? I go, yeah, I like curry chicken. Oh, Lord. <laughs> That's the hottest stuff I ever put in my mouth. For days, I'd sweat and I'd smell like curry chicken. <laughs> now, when the little lady comes, I said, milder, <laughs> you know, you know. Uh, listen, hottest stuff in that. Listen, I get to travel all over the world, and I've been in some situations that's pretty, pretty amazing. We was in this place, and they were there's one of the most prestigious guys in the whole thing was throwing a big banquet for us in a foreign country, and so I couldn't see because they had candles instead of light. And here's a big old table. There, there are cameras there. There's all kind of people, and here's the main guy that's putting this big banquet on. And so they bring in the food that's supposed to be, for me, the honored guest. And I can't, they set it down in front of me, and it's dark, and I can't hardly see. And I'm trying to focus on what it is. And there's a ton of people in there, and I'm looking at it, and guess what I saw? Two fuzzy ears sticking up. <laughs> monkey head! <laughs> yes, they, they craned the monkey, boiled the brains, packed the monkey back with his ball brains and the guest gets to go take the cr that little cranium off and eat the you know and yet they tell you now don't turn down whatever they offer you it's very offensive I thought I'm going to offend them one way or the other <laughs> you know when you're just about to puke and the hot water gets up in your throat I was there <laughs> I said to myself I ain't eating no monkey head I don't care who's offended. I ain't eating monkey head. <laughs> and anyway, I said, God, you're going to have to do something. And uh, listen, I changed my voice. I sounded like Billy Graham, Oral Roberts, and <laughs> everybody you could think of. I changed my voice, and I looked at the, the gentleman that was doing the banquet. I said, sir, sir, the holy word of God declares, give honor to whom honor is due. And I would be so honored if you would take this. <laughs> Woo! People were clapping. I thought they were going to give me the key to the city. But see, you've got to memorize some verses. You know? It'll help you in situations like that. You won't have to eat, you know, some poor baked monkey head, you know. But anyway, it worked out good. I got a lot of stories like that. Uh, All right, I'm going to read to you about the gavel of God. And I'm telling you, this, this happened years ago. Your mom was in the, in the, in the, uh, the meeting when we first talked about uh, having this experience with the Ancient of Days. And uh, we were off, I think, maybe in Albany, Oregon. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And, and we get, we get uh, and it, the whole thing is in here again because God said, I'm bringing this back because now's the time for fresh oil and fresh fire. God's going to all up the saints of God and then set us ablaze. The all means the, the word of God. And the Bible says, when I wash my steps in butter, the rocks poured forth oil. I like that, don't you? A rock's a hard thing. Now, butter in the Bible talks about the thickest type of anointing. When I wash my steps in butter, the rocks poured forth oil. So anyway, in this experience, I get caught up into heaven, and there's a great big brass door there. Looks like it's never been opened and hadn't been opened in a long time. And a voice said, open the door. I said, I don't have a key. He said again, only more strong, open the door. I don't have a key. Third time, open the door. I don't have a key. And he screamed, you are the key. And so he told me to stick my hand in the lock. I stuck my hand in the lock, rotated my hand a little bit, and the door opened like this. And when the door opened, uh, we put it all in the shepherd's yard. When the door opened, colored uh, wind 
wind of various colors started shooting over my shoulder into the crack into the door. Uh, when the door opened, it had a vacuum sound. Whoosh, you've opened coffee or something like that, and all this was amplified. Whoosh, and this, these, these colored winds began to blow over my shoulder and go in the door. Later, I asked the Ancient of Days, I said, what was a colored wind blowing over my shoulder? He said, the cumulative prayers of the saints of old. Isn't that something? And we get to go in. And I, I got to meet the Ancient of Days. Like to kill me? Fire shot out of my eyes, out of my ears, out of the fingertips. And we talk all about it here. I said, I want you to tell me who you are. He said, I'm the wisdom of the ages. I'm the, I'm the, the voice of the prophets. I am, I am the Ancient of Days. And boy, I'll tell you what. Uh, he's in charge. The word ancient of days is God in his majesty and his power. Okay? And that, that's uh, who we need to really understand is running the show. He, he, he's the one that took the gavel and de declared that we're in, in Daniel 2, 7, verses 21 and 22. said the evil forces, the devil, was winning until the ancient of days stands, renders a verdict on behalf of the saints of God, and the saints will do what? Possess a kingdom. Can, can they put that verse up there again? Let's do it. Could they do it? Uh, the one Daniel 7, verse uh, 21 and 22. That they, they, they'll be on it like a, you know. Come on here with it. I just, I can read it. I can, it, it's in the Bible. Here it is. You ready? The time is now. That's what it says. I kept looking in the horn. That means the evil, that means the devil, the demons, the uh, antichrist, everybody. I kept looking and the horn was making war with the saints, the believers, and overpowering them. Wow. Until the ancient of days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the most high God. And the time arrived when the saints, the believers, took possession of the kingdom. That's where you and, our, we, you and I are today. The devil was winning until... The Ancient of Days renders a verdict in behalf of the saints of God, and the saints of God will possess the land and the kingdom. So that's what we're going to do. We're in a season of recovery. There we go. Y'all can read that. I looked, and this horn, look out now. I better get over here. They, they got me kind of like a, you, you never had to have, wear an ankle bracelet, you know, when you're arrested or <laughs> you can't get too far from the house. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> So I, so I can't walk around much. I, I don't have no ankle bracelet on. But uh, <sighs> the guy that used to, the judge who used to lock me up the most, bought me my first preaching suit. Hey, that's the honest to God truth. When I first started preaching, the first few rows would be policemen. It's the honest to God truth. The judge that used to lock me up the most, his name is Judge Winston Reagan, bought me my first preaching suit. He came to me later on and says, Bobby, you know why I bought you that suit? I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, now, I'm a Methodist. And Methodists don't talk like this. He said a voice came to me and spoke to me and told me to buy you that suit. See, pretty wild, isn't it? Yeah, okay. So, anyway, it doesn't, it doesn't matter much how you start, it's how you end. You know what I mean? We, I started rough. Good Lord. My mama ran the coat hanger in her womb, tried to pull me out. Yes! My mother took a coat hanger, turned it into a hook, inserted it into her womb, and tried to pull me out. The hand of the Lord, so help me God, came, pushed me aside, kept my mother from extracting my life out of her body. Now you say, why was she doing it? She was actually trying to do it out of mercy. Because my father, 37 years old, was dying a lunatic in an insane asylum. He caught a venereal disease, sleeping with strange women, caught a venereal disease that settled in his brain. He died at 37 years old, a lunatic in an insane asylum. This is 1943. And so the, the doctors talked to my mother and said, the baby inside your belly will be afflicted with the same disease killing his father. So that's when she took the coat hanger, turned it into the hook. I told my wife about it before my mother ever told me. She said, here's what my wife said. Bobby, nobody can know what happened to him when he's a fetus. I said, me and John the Baptist do. Remember, he got full of the Holy Ghost where? In his mommy's tummy. So the hand of the Lord pushed me aside. That's in the Bible. He covered me in my mother's womb. And so anyway... Uh, that's, that's how it started. I'm writing a story about my life. Started out, uh, really, as a fetus, I was no bigger than my fist. And the hand of the Lord came and covered me. Anyway, so I'm here by divine assignment. So are you. Yes. Aren't you glad? Yes. I'm glad God chose us. And he chose us in eternity past to live in the present, to forge the future. So anyway, I hope you'll get into Shepherd's Rod. Uh, and uh, God, God really will show you some things. We've got to... We've got to mobilize now. 
These angels that came to see me on the Day of Atonement, they're taller in this building. They were screaming. They were screaming, divine urgency, sound the alarm. I'm screaming, awake the warriors. And so God is calling the church to now be strong and become a real militant warrior for the things of God. We can't be passive anymore. Well, you know, uh, I'm just, no, no, we've got to be bold and brave, very courageous. That's what it says. Joshua 1, 9, be bold, be brave, be very courageous. Go do what you're called to do because you're not going by yourself. Who's going with you? The Lord. The Bible said, Jeremiah eleven twenty. the Lord is with me as a dread champion. The word dread champion means mighty warrior. See, I can go walk over here, you know, and don't, don't get, all right. Okay, you say, Bobby, you seem so docile. You, you didn't get in trouble, did you? <laughs> yeah, I did. I got hit in the head. Cops knocked a hole in my head. You can stick your finger in there if you needed to. It's got a hole in my head. I'm, I'm living proof the way of the transgressor is hard. You know, there's pleasure in sin, but it's for a little short time. So don't, don't get off into sin, okay? Uh, there's a high cost for low living. You believe that? The wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, a lot of people think, well, the plan of salvation is so difficult, so hard. How can I understand it? That's not true. The Bible said the way of salvation is so simple that a wayfaring fool need not ear therein. I said, God, give me that in Texican. Here it is. The Bible said, the way of salvation is so simple, a wayfaring fool need not ear that in. Here's what God said in, in, in my language. He said, tell the people if they got enough sense to get back to their house, they got enough sense to get saved. Amen. That's what it means. See, the plan of salvation is not complicated. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All that come to him, he'll in no wise cast out. The Bible said if we'll confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Aren't you glad? Yeah. I'm glad it's not complicated that you have to jump through a whole bunch of hoops. All you got to do is realize that you're lost. You say, well, you know, I'm a good person. That's not near enough. Yeah. I'm telling you, we all were born in sin. In sin did my mother conceive me. And so we need to be born again. And boy, when you get born again, the Bible said in Colossians 1.13, he takes us out of Colossians 1.13, takes us out of the family of death and darkness, puts us in the family of life, love, and liberation. It's the best journey you can take, isn't it? Well, sure. That's right. How do you know you're born again? His spirit dwells, bears witness with your spirit. See, when you get born again, the Holy Ghost comes to live inside of you. The same Holy Ghost that is in Christ. Why? Why would the same Holy Ghost get into you that's in Christ? Because Jesus said, as my Father's sending me, even so now I'm sending you. The Bible said, as he is, so are we in this present world. Now, there's some verses in the Bible, if Jesus didn't say it, I'd never believe it. Here's one. These works that I do and greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. Doing greater works than what Jesus did. That's what the Bible said. That's why we need the Holy Ghost. I don't care how brilliant you are. The things of God, even the simplest phrase of God is so profound, you can't get it with the natural mind. The Bible said the natural mind, the kind you and I have, and receives not the things of the Spirit, it's foolishness to you, neither can you know it, must be spiritually discerned. So you could be as smart as Einstein and dumb as a dog when it comes to understanding the Bible. You have to have been taught and tutored by the Holy Ghost. And he'll do it for you. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, the truth-giving spirit, he'll not speak his own message on his own authority, Jesus said, but he'll give the message that has been given unto him. And it also says the Holy Ghost will tell you what's going to happen in the future. Yes, it does. See, a lot of people, they want to dial a, a demon, the one 900 dial a psychic. You can't get the future from a psychic. You can get a demon, but you can't get the future. The Bible said out of the lips of Jesus, the Holy Spirit will tell you what's going to happen in the future. We need to study more about the Holy Ghost. He's our counselor. He's our advocate. He's our go-between. Go he's everything we need. Without him, we can't do a single thing. That's what it says, John 15, 5. John 15, 5 says, without me, you can do nothing. Oh, the first time I ever read that man, I was young and fiery, and I got mad. What? What does he mean I can't do nothing? And then I chilled out a little. I thought, well, maybe I don't understand the Greek word nothing. <laughs> so back then you had to get weeds and vines and these big old thick books, and I'm looking for nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. I found it. Guess what the Greek word nothing means? 
a great big vac a zero with a vacuum sucked in it. It's less than nothing. So without him controlling our life, it amounts to nothing. But through him, by him, in him, we can do all things. Philippians 1. It says, I can do all things through Christ who infuses me with what? Inner strength. Yeah, that's right. I was famous. I could knock a horse out with one punch and pick up the front end of a Chevy 2 car when I was growing up. That's how I got to fight the famous bear story. Yeah, see, look at it. We cage fight before they paid you to do it. That's true. I can put anybody in here in a rear naked choke just like that. Look at it. It's kind of like getting to go to heaven, but you get to come back. You ever been in the rear naked choke? You know, you, you cut the blood off the brain and oxygen off. And, and anyway, in case one of you need it, I'm, I'm your man. <laughs> And give you a spinning back fist. You know, we did all that before they started paying people to do it. Yeah. Anyway, I grew up really, really, uh, I don't know. Didn't have a daddy. My mother's, my drunk uncle, she got him one time to come down and whip me. And I just wasn't going to take a whipping from a drunk uncle. You know how that is. So I knocked him out and knocked his false teeth out of his mouth, knocked him unconscious, and his false teeth ran on the couch, fell on the couch, and there's my poor mama. There's her brother knocked unconscious, and she's got a mop handle trying to drag his teeth out from under the sofa. <laughs> See? That's how I grew up. <laughs> and uh, I could tell you a bad bunch of bad stories, but I better stay with this. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to look. I'm going to show you a verse here. John 16, verse uh, 13. Uh, it's talking about the Holy, Holy Spirit. John 16, verse 13. Jesus is teaching us about the teacher of the Holy Spirit. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, the full, complete truth. For he will not speak his own message on his own initiative, but he will speak whatever he hears from the Father, the message regarding the Son, and he will disclose to you what is to come in the future. That's John 16, verse 13. Wow. Don't you, don't you want him to give you revelation and inspiration and understanding? You can't get it anywhere but the Holy Spirit. You can't get, I don't care how smart you are, the smallest phrase from God is so difficult, you can't understand it with the natural mind. That's what it says. Revelation is God releasing information to us, but you have to have the Holy Spirit to discern the information. You understand that? That's right. What do you do, this guy right here? You laugh? Well, what do you do? I was wondering if you were going to ask me this question yeah. last night. Okay, I'm asking this morning. I don't know how to answer. I'm a gardener. A gardener? A gardener. I don't understand all that. What are you gardening? I plant seeds everywhere I go. Plant seeds, okay. Now, be smart enough not to plant them out in the middle of the road. <laughs> yeah. Plant your seed in good soil, okay? You can't just throw your st gifts around. Mm -hmm. You understand that? That's foolish, isn't it? So plant your seed in good soil, okay? And then you can have fruit that will remain. All right? That's pretty good. Tell him that's the truth. That's the truth. That's right. Yeah. But anyway, just keep it up and see what happens, okay? The Bible said, give, and it'll be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You ever heard about, uh, 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 there's a man in Texas, and he's famous for giving away 90% of his wealth and building his company on 10%. Right. R.G. Letourneau. And uh, here, here's what happened. Uh, it baffled these uh, Wall Street people. They, they, they set him up for an interview. And here's what they said. Mr. Letourneau, or they said, uh, is, uh, how can you build your massive uh, empire when you give away 90% of your wealth to charitable funds, churches? And here's what he said. He's a country boy. He said, well, I, God shovels it in, and I shovel it out, and God uses a bigger shovel. So he's the guy that invented the Euclid the, and then the one that invented the offshore oil rigs. You can R.G. Letourneau. But anyway, see, he gave 90% of his wealth away and built this. Isn't that something? Yeah. So we've got to give, and then we be given back to us good measure, pressed down, shake it together, and what? Running over. Yeah. See, God is a God of abundance. That, that's, that's true. Over there in Deuteronomy, uh, it says in Deuteronomy, it says, he caused him to siphon honey from the rock. Now, rock's a hard thing, honey. It's talking about the strong anointing. Sometimes the hardest places can release the sweetest anointing. Deuteronomy 32, 13. He caused him to siphon honey 
from the rock. I like that, don't you? Religious spirits don't like honey. That, but uh, they, they, don't, they don't really like the anointing of the Spirit of God because they can't figure it out naturally. The natural mind can't grasp it. That's why, that's why I, like to, I like to wow people with the supernatural. I levitated while I was preaching. What? Yeah. Yeah, I was preaching. And the Lord said, I'm going to show up in a very de demonstrative way. And I thought, okay, what are you going to do? He said, you just watch. I was down in Argentina. It's on film. And I start lifting up. And I lifted up. I look down. There's the full pit in my Bible and my water. The way down there. I'm up there. And the whole people are screaming, fainting, running, falling. They're levitated. No hooks, no wires. Just levitated by the Spirit of God. I've been in two places at once. What? <laughs> been in two places at once. Documentable. I, I was in bed with my wife. And I was in a bull ring in Peru preaching. Here's a, here, here it is. This is the story. So here we go. I'm in, I'm in bed with my wife, Carolyn. But in the spirit realm, I'm in a bull ring in Peru preaching. So in, in the bull ring, I've got to go and leave. And get, they're going to carry me to the airport to catch a plane. We're way out in the bush in the jungle of Peru up on a mountainside. And so we're going down. And so they didn't want me to walk down the steep trail. They put me on a llama. <laughs> you know, a llama. So I'm on the llama, riding the llama down the hill. In the, I'm still in bed with my wife. And I'm riding the llama down the hill in Peru. And uh, I said to the llama, are you in the camel family? And he goes, I certainly am. <laughs> so anyway, we get down there to the bottom of the mountain. And the truck is up there. And uh, it, I, I can walk down and get on a bridge, but it'll take longer. So I thought, no, I can just jump to the other side of this volcano stream. Had on the cowboy boots. And I jumped. Didn't quite make it. Slid back into the thing. Got red mud all over my cowboy boots. But when I'm riding the llama down, uh, I said, are you in the camel family? He says, I certainly am. I said, well, you feel like Mouton. That's what I said. That's when I woke my wife up. She said, I, I was sitting up in the middle of bed going hollering, you look like Mouton. You look like Mouton. And so anyway, we, we wake up that morning. And my wife said, what in the world happened to you last night? I said, I don't know. I was in Peru preaching in a bull ring. I got on a llama. She said, you woke me up in the middle of the night sitting in the bed hollering, Mouton, you feel like Mouton. So she, we laughed and giggled. She gets up and goes into the kitchen to plug in the coffee. So I'd hung my blue jeans over a, a clothes tree in, you know, the back end of a chair. So I get up to get my blue jeans, and guess what's all down here in the crotch? Llama hair. There's my red boots. Guess, who that, what, guess what's all over them? Red mud. But see, I was in my bedroom, and then my pants got uh, llama hair on it. My boots got, uh, see, two places at one time. So that, you, that can happen. Anything you find in the Bible can happen. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that are revealed belong unto us and our descendants from now on. Anything you find in the Bible, Paul levitated. Paul was called up in the third heaven. God is no respecter of persons. You understand that? So anything you find in the Bible, you can position yourself saying, Lord, I, I want it. Okay? So you're a so seed sower and what else? Stay at home dad. Stay at home dad. Oh, boy, that's, that's, that's wonderful. We've got to zero in on our families, haven't we? Yeah. The devil's after them. Every, have you ever studied history? Every culture has had child sacrifice every one of them yes. they would carry their in the bible days they'd carry their children throw them in the arms of a demon called Moloch. and uh here we just have abortion i'm saying every every culture has uh child sacrifice but i'm telling i'm telling you uh god god is going to put an end to this abortion uh, really he really is I'm, you watch you watch you say well I don't want us to get involved in that. We're involved. See, here's what it says. The he the, here's what it says. The heavens of heavens, that belongs to God. This earth is your responsibility. Yeah. When did God give us that responsibility? Well, in the book of Genesis. Let us make man our own image and give them kingdom authority. That's what it says. That's what he says. Isn't that something? So the heavens of heavens, that belong to God, but this earth is our responsibility. Oh, Wow. 
So we're responsible for all these fires burning. I believe we could pray and put them out. Don't you think? See, God said, whatever you'll bind on earth will have been bound for you in heaven. Whatever you deem legal here can be, don't you understand that? So uh, it, it's, it, we've got a track record that it works. We went, to, we went to when it was 106 degrees, August the 28th, and prophesied a snowstorm. Remember that when the wildfires were burning in the northwest and the s- snowstorm came, put the fires out? That's pretty wild, isn't it? See, God's up to something. He's always active if we'll just act with him, okay? Find out his plan. You, you, he's got a plan for you. It says this, he said, he, he created things for you to do before he created you. That's Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus and the good works which God pre-planned for us to conduct ourselves in them. So he created things for you to do before you were you. That's purpose, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So I looked at the word, I read Ephesians 2.10 in a, out of every English translation I could find. And it says we are his workmanship, and that's a, that's a Greek word that means the final stroke of a master artist. So when the devil goes, who do you think you are? Go, I'm the best God could do. <laughs> See, that's what, that's what it means. I'm the final stroke of a master artist. Ephesians 2.10, you can see it. For we're God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do these good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking part. Well, and so he said, I created these things for you to do. And so all of us have something God wants us to do. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 said there's a time and a season, a purpose for every activity of God under heaven. A time and a season and a purpose for every activity of God under heaven. So we need to find out what God's doing and join him. Here's what it says, Psalms 139, verses, uh, says, it says, all of our days are written in his book before we've ever lived a single one of them. That's pretty cool, isn't it? God wrote down every day of our life in his book. There's another way to get your name written in God's book. You want it? This is all true. Don't lie in church. If you want your name, if you want God to write your name in his book, get a bunch of your friends together, spend time talking about how much you love Jesus. God will take notice of it and he'll write it in his book. Where's that at, preacher? Malachi 3.16, that's where that's at. Look it up for yourself or put it on the screen, Malachi 3.16. Get your friends together, spend time talking about how much you love Jesus. God will take notice of it and write your name in his book. That's pretty wild, isn't it? Why, well, sure it is. When those who feared the Lord talked often one with another and the Lord listened and heard it and a book of remembrance was written before him of those. Isn't that something? Get your friends together and have a party talking about how good God is. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there's no variableness nor shadow of turning. What the heck does that mean? No variableness nor shadow of turning. It means God ain't fickle. Our culture is fickle, but God is not fickle. I am the Lord. I change not. Aren't you glad he doesn't change? Forever, O oh God, thy word is settled. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God. See, this sound is working nice today, isn't it? So much better. Okay. That's pretty amazing. Do you believe that God will do everything he said he'll do? All of the promises are what? Yes. Yes. And amen. Amen. And I'm telling you, it says the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Forever, O God, thy word is settled in the heavens. God's word does not need to be revised. Aren't you glad? Now, we've got, uh, 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 we've got two sons, Carolyn and I. The oldest son, uh, when he was born, now that was, that was, a, that was a real hoot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, this is this is uh, the kind of person uh, my wife was pregnant. It's Christmas time. She's pregnant with our first son. And uh, she had bought me, this is Christmas. Now, you can't buy a prophet something him not know what it is. <laughs> so she had bought me a, a target pistol and 500 rounds of ammunition for Christmas. Because I, I would go to the dump and shoot rats. You could do that then. They had big old garbage dumps. And I could go there and shoot rats. And so we're out there at her mother's for Christmas dinner. 
and she's pregnant. And she said, Bobby, I think I'm in labor. I said, no, you're not in labor. I wanted to go shoot rats with my new pistol. <laughs> so she said, no, I'm, I'm in labor. I said, no, honey, you're not. She said, I'm going to go home. So we had two cars. So she's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm up in front, and she's behind me. And so I rode down the window, and I wave at her, turning into the dump. And she goes on home. And I was elated with my new target pistol, 500 rounds of ammunition and plenty of rats. And so I, I got carried away. I had on my rubber boots because the garbage stinks. And I'd shot a whole bunch of times. And I looked and I thought, oh, my Lord, I've been here quite a while. I better go home and check on Carolyn. And we had made this plan on what to do when she goes into labor. She had her little luggage packed and all this. Now, this is what happened. I was late because of the rat shoot. So I, I drive into the yard, and I get out of the car, and I go in there, and I'm expecting to find Carolyn maybe at the sink or something, washing dishes or something. She ain't at the sink. She's in the recliner going, oh, oh. I go, my God, she's in labor. I go absolutely berserk. This is all true. I ran and grabbed the luggage that we're supposed to carry to the hospital, and I took off running and slammed the door. There's the hole. That's where the dead bolt of the door went in my hand, right there. I'm impaled. I impaled myself on the front door and left Carolyn still in there. Blood's pumping, just shooting out of my arm right there, my hand right there. She has to come to the door. Get me unplugged out of the where the dead boat went through my hand right there. Wrap my hand up in a big old towel and off to the... When we got to the hospital, they thought it was me as a patient. <laughs> now, here's what happened. She's, in, she's sweating and she's... Uh, anyway, she had an army nurse. And the old army nurse sounded like a horse walking on the bridge. <laughs> and there they get Carolyn. They put her on her gurney cover up in a sheet, and here comes the army nurse. And she pulls back the sheet like this, and here's what came out of her mouth. You ready? Oh, my God, get the doctor. Now, I don't need to hear something like that. See, because I was already a little bit, you know, beside myself. Oh, my God, get the doctor. And they took her off like that. I'm standing out in the hall like this. And so, guess some guy goes, what are you doing? I said, they took my wife off. They put me in a little room by the hallway there. And so I'm sitting in there. And I thought, yep, I'll tell you what's happened. They've carried her back there and let something happen. They ain't got guts enough to come out here and tell me. That's what I said to myself. <laughs> but I said to myself, I'm getting me some answers. Because I hear gurneys going by. So the next gurney. I explode out of the door. I wheel around, throw the doctor up in the in a chokehold against the wall. This is all true. It'll get the police called on you. I said, oh, what happened? And he said, they didn't tell you. See, they didn't tell you. When they rolled her back there, she spit the boy out. And I've been in a hall closet sweating bullets. Nobody came to go, well, you got a bouncing baby boy. See? And then, you know, it gets worse. <laughs> this is all true. I'm a little volatile. So that we got our first baby. And he's about that big around, about that long. And so my wife said, uh, honey, I want you to go and we, I want you to buy this. She gave me a note on what to buy. So I go to the, I go to the store and the lady comes up and I said, ma'am. I want to buy a case of shellac. She said, what are you painting? I said, painting? I'm not painting nothing. It's for our new baby. She said, you mean Similac. <laughs> see, see, so I almost bought a case of shellac. Oh, man. It's a wonder we made it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, oh boy. Back then, they had real diapers. That stuff they got now looks like a sandwich wrapper. Back then, I mean, they were real. You had to do something with them. I'd carry them, drop them in the toilet until Carolyn got home, you know. 
Yeah, real diapers. Now you got them little things you fold up. And I know guys in Texas, they can gut a deer and can't change a diaper. <laughs> you know what I mean? Man up. You got to get it. Okay. I got some more books to talk to you about. Oh, goodness gracious. All right. Here we go. Ecclesiastes 3.8, a time to love and a time to hate, a time to war and a time for peace. It's time for the church to wake up out of our slumber and put on our war mode. We're at war, not, not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in high places. Now, I don't know about you, but we need to ask some questions and get some straight answers. I said to the Lord, God, how did all these principalities and powers get in America so quick? And because we all just woke up overnight, and there they are. Principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in high places. So I asked him, how did they get here so quick? And here's what he told me. You ready? Back there, at, when Donald Trump was president of the United States of America, he read the State of the Union address. Remember that? Yeah, well, you probably don't. But behind him was Nancy Pelosi with a, a hellish, demonic grin and was tearing up, tearing up the manuscript. Now, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and that's where the demons came from. That was witchcraft, rebellion at a high portal. And so that's how the, 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 the demons got into America in such a rapid place. It was a rebellion at a high portal. But I'll tell you what, you and I need to put on a warring mode. Resist the devil and he'll flee. The Bible said, I got a piece of crushed Satan on your feet, Romans 16, 20. We've got to understand, the devil would, if he could, kill every one of us in this room today. But he can't harm a hair of our head. We belong to Jesus. And he's more afraid of us than we are him. He knows greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. He knows that you are more than a conqueror. He knows that no weapon formed against you will prosper. See, he knows more about you than you're willing to receive about yourself. He's under your feet. Behold, I give you power to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and it will no wise harm you. We've been given authority and power, and we need to exercise it, don't you think? This means yes, most of the time. All right. Was Johnny pretty good with the babies? Was he pretty good? Good. Yeah. Oh, boy. I, I, I love children, but I like them when they're kind of big enough to express themselves. I'll tell you who I like. I like little children and old people. They don't have a filter. They'll just tell you, I don't like you. <laughs> Go, Join the group, you know. But, you know, but that's what we got to have. We got to have no filters. Don't, don't you think? Matter of fact, the Bible said, except we become as a little child, we can't see or enter the kingdom. We may have to digress in order to advance because the natural mind can't receive the things of God. Little children, they can respond. Just to be quite honest with you, little children can see angels away before you can. That's what it says, except you become as a little child, you can't see or enter the kingdom. We've got to get, get more childlike. Not childish, childlike. There's a world of difference, isn't there? Yeah. So what do you do? Tell me about yourself. I'm retired now, but I used to work in agriculture. Farming. Ag farming. Yeah. we got to quit selling all of our farmland to China. Amen. They're going to try to starve us out. Yeah. Uh, they, they, there's a real, real thing going on there. But it's, it's just part of the enemy's plan. Here's the deal. You cannot have uh, Christianity and communism. Right. They just won't work. And so the far left is uh, just bulging with communist yeah. but God's going to be uh, he's going to take our side Thank you. Uh, that's right the, the Lord is on our side he's a mighty warrior Jeremiah uh, what 2011 the Lord is with me as a dread champion therefore my persecutors will not prevail Amen. they will have eternal everlasting shame that's what it says isn't that something all right we better get back here you doing okay I'm doing well, thank you. is he behaving himself or Anything we need to know about? You know? <laughs> he, he said, I'll give you a, a, a swift kick here in a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it wonderful to be born again? Absolutely. Isn't that something? Listen, I, I, we, we, we cannot 
afford to let people go to hell. Amen. The Bible says that we need to be busy winning souls. Amen. God wants us to fill this whole earth with knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the ocean. And here's, what, here's the deal. A lot of people are going, oh, the rapture. He's not coming for us till he first comes to us. He's not going to come for us till he first comes to us, okay? And we're going to fill the whole earth with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the ocean. And it's meetings like this that help. And we need to understand we don't know anything unless the Holy Ghost can teach us. We can't go, oh, you don't know. I preach a message sometimes. I might, I might do it if I'm preaching again or something or you can look it up on the web. I preach a message on what to do when you don't know what to do. What to do when you don't have a clue. You may be here and go, well, I'll tell you, brother, that's not apropos for me because I always know what I'm going to do. Let me find a word that would fit for you, okay? <laughs> Under moron, idiot. <laughs> if you think you're going to always know what to do, I promise you God will put you on a journey that's beyond your pay grade. He'll do it for you. It's, this is in the Bible. It says, these men that do business in great waters, they see the works of the Lord because he raises up the stormy winds. It lifts up the waves as high as the heavens. It drops them down as low as the depths. These seasoned sailors stagger to and fro. They're at their wits' end. That means they've expired, expended, expelled every bit of their expertise, and nothing had stopped about the storm. Wow. What to do when you don't know what to do? See, God raised the winds. Was he trying to hurt those guys? No, he's trying to help them. To show them how desperately they needed him. Next verse says, oh, that man would praise God for his goodness. It says, then they cried unto the Lord. When? When they were at their wits' end. Now, God started the storm not to hurt them, but to help them. To show them how desperately they needed him. So that God will do the same thing for us. He'll get us into a circumstance where it's beyond our ability to solve it. Then we cry out to the Lord. Showing us how much we really need him. He's a very present help when. Have you read Nahum 1.7? That's my favorite verse in the Bible. Nahum chapter 1 verse 7 says, God is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those that are trusting him. I'm so thankful he didn't say God was good. Or he's going to be good. Right in the middle of our mess. God's good. Yeah. Aren't you glad? Yeah. Nahum 1.7. God is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those that are trusting him. Hadn't you enjoyed watching these little kids praise? And they're wonderful. Uh, uh, have you noticed it's in them? I mean, they, they little. They don't have to be taught. Just get them in the presence, you know. They, they can see angels. They can feel the Spirit of God. Yeah. You go, well, why can't I? Well, you ought to ask the Lord. Maybe, you, you know. Maybe you've made some judgments against him or someone else. Wow. I was, years ago, I was down in Tulsa fixing to do a meeting. Bob Jones called me and goes, hey, boy. I said, yes. He said, God's putting gold teeth in people's mouth. I said, yeah, I know he's doing that, but he's not doing it in my ministry. And Bob said, well, he is doing it. So he hung up. So I'm preaching that morning in Tulsa, and I'm walking back and forth preaching, but I'm also talking to God. See, the Bible said, surely God will not do anything without first revealing what he's going to do to his servants and prophets. So I screamed out, hey, God, why are you doing something without me? And he said, oh, because you mocked me and made fun of me. And one day I took a, a book and read in the past where God did miracles in people's mouths. And, and I, I said to the, my congregation, God wouldn't do something like that. Yeah, he would put real teeth in. You know? And so God said, if you'll repent, I'll do it. So I stopped right there in Tulsa and said, God, I'm so sorry I put my opinion above your, your, your word. Some guy came forward for hip surgery and God gave him two gold teeth. He fell out and he said, I came for a hip surgery. I said, I can't give you. And I could walk by people and get gold teeth. I preached funerals and people got gold teeth. People that didn't even want gold teeth got gold teeth. One pastor came with his elders to disprove the gold teeth. And he got a whole mouthful of gold teeth. His wife said, honey, you've got a mouthful of... And he, go, he rebuked her. And she gave him her compact. And he looked and fainted. <laughs> Not, he didn't fall out in the Holy Ghost. He just fainted. But thousands of people got gold teeth. I could walk by people and they get gold teeth. See? But I, that God wasn't going to do it because I'd mocked him. 
So when I repented, so uh, maybe you need to ask God, have I done something that offended you? And then get it cleaned up, okay? Search me, O God, and try me. See if there's been, okay? Because he wants to daily communicate with you. In John 10, 3, my sheep do what? Hear my voice, they follow me. John 10, 27 said they'll run from other voices because they don't know who it is. Now, see, my wife and I have been married, oh, Lord, 58 years, I think it is. If she calls me and I go, who is this? Ooh. See, I should be able to tell whether she's happy or sad just by the cadence of her voice. Don't you think? That's right. That's right. I like that. That means clear for takeoff if you're on a jet carrier. Let's mess around a minute. You, you want to? Yeah. He said, just keep it up and see what happens. Okay? Just keep it up. Okay? Start writing down what he's showing you. Okay? Book of Habakkuk 2 says, write the vision, make it plain so people can run with it. Okay? So that's good. Do you believe that God is going to, uh, uh, the Lord told me, he said, Bobby, tell the preachers, make your plans as if money was no problem. I said, God, that sounds irresponsible. He, he said, what's irresponsible is not to do what you're told to do. So God had the audacity to name himself what? El Shaddai. The God that's more than you'll ever have need of. Isn't that good? What do you do? A pasture? Okay. I'll tell you what. Have you know the sheep bite? Have you ever been? You know, if you're pastoring, sometimes you have sheep bite. Yeah, I pasture. True. That is true. But I'll tell you what. We need to pray for the pastures, honestly. The Bible said, as the priest, so the people. Is that correct? It's really true. But anyway, that's wonderful. Oh, Lord, we've been pastoring, good gracious, for quite a while. One of the best things we never do is teach the people the Word of God, the Bible. Yeah. So that's, so, all right, he's going to keep it up. Look. Oh, that hair. I prophesied about that hair before it ever came. I prophesied about ladies with purple hair, red hair, and all of that. And then I was in uh, Stockholm and when I first saw the first one that had them. But now they're all over the place. Purple hair, green, green hair. Did I tell you when I was in this big fancy church? Well, yes, I was. And it's a Sunday morning, and the doctor, pastor is a doctor, and he's sitting there, and he's got beautiful, immaculate uh, gray hair pulled back like this, not a hair out of place. And so I'm up there preaching in his church on Sunday. And I'm preaching, and a kid walks in, a, teen, a teenager kid, college kid, walked in with a big old purple spiked hair. And I said Sunday morning, hey, dude, where you been? He goes, oh, I overslept. I said, come here. And here he comes down there. And I, I said, uh, you know what we ought to do? And he goes, No. I said, we ought to spike Pastor Paul's hair. It's Sunday morning, doctor degrees, pastor, and me saying to this guy, let's spike Pastor Paul's hair. And Pastor Paul's going, mm -hmm. and this kid goes, dude, that's what I've got in this sack. He had a sack full of hair spike. I said, see, we're in. I said, get up here. I got the pasture here, and I got a choir robe, put it on him, poured water all over his head, immaculate hair, and I got into the, the dope stuff you, you spike their hair with. It's, uh, I, it's uh, real sticky. And so there he is, and I, I go, and I combed him up. I combed him up a spike about like that. I had him looking like something between a porcupine and a rhinoceros, you know. All the way across him. And this, this kid, I've never seen him before in my whole life. He goes, <laughs> it's going to take weeks for that to get off. You know. <laughs> so I said to God, God, how is this going to help the church? And I'll tell you how it helped it. The next Sunday, the whole section over there was filled with these gothic teenagers. <laughs> because the pastor let us spike his hair. And fill the whole side of the, the, the building with these gothic kids coming to hear the gospel of a pastor who would sit there and let people put a purple spike in his hair. See, God knows how to fix up things. See, I wish I'd have had that in my plan, but I didn't, you know. 
I was just winging it. <laughs> and he did look quite odd. <laughs> there were four or five words and none of them were fit. But, uh, you know, but it won those young people over. Isn't that something? See? Pastor Johnny said, it ain't going to happen here, though. <laughs> so, but anyway, ah, oh, good Lord. I get to preach, I get to preach in the largest youth conferences in the world. I'll be 80 my next birthday. And I thought, what do they want? So they want to see an old guy sweat or, you know, a fat guy breathing or something. Anyway, I was down there in California preaching to about four or 5,000 young people. And I called this guy out, a teenager, a college kid about that tall. And I said to him, what do you do? And he looked at me and goes, dude, I got a screen band. I said, what? He said, a screen band. And then he said, and nearly 5,000 young people, I got a gig after this one. You want to go? And I go, yeah. <laughs> so I've told all those people I'm going. In an abandoned mall, it started at 2 a.m. in the morning and goes till sunup. So come with me on my first and my only screen band concert. Here we go. In comes the crowd into an abandoned mall. They hook up the computer, and I'm the guest, so they put me right here. And the speaker's about, I don't know, 10 times as big as that one right there. And they start. I'm here. Speaker's right there. And they start. You can't say it's music. It's just... <laughs> My hair goes, you can feel your blood going, and they start. Oh, it's horrible. The kid starts, and he grabs the microphone, and my only definition of scream band is like the kid swallowed the mic and spent the rest of the night trying to cough it up <laughs> all night long. I'm right here. I'm telling you, the kid's right up there, and the Lord said, what do you think about this, Bobby? I said, what do you think about it? He said, I think they'll win people that'll never come here. You preach. And these kids started making their way down the aisle. They would throw down narcotics. They'd throw down other things. They'd give their heart to Christ. It was amazing. God said, Bobby, don't ever change the message, but adopt new methods. Never change the message, but adopt new methods. Finally, it got daylight. Whew. <laughs> so the crowd and, and the kid was packing his stuff up. So I got up there to him. I said, sir. Uh, I'm sorry, I could not understand one single <laughs> lyric that you sang. Would you please show me your song sheet? Flopped his computer open. Here's a song sheet. You ready? Have you been to Jesus for his cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood? There's a fountain filled with blood and sinners pumped beneath his flood. Lose all the guilt and stain. He took the old songs about the blood and put them in a genre that these kids could respond to. See, never change the message, but adopt new methods. Now, I'm not wanting to go to another screen band concert. <laughs> It's, it was uh, electrifying. <laughs> yeah. yeah, But anyway, these kids, what's going to shock a lot of you, the holy reverential fear of God is going to come upon the millennials. And they're going to be moving and marching in a cadence we've not seen before. They've been aimless, but they're going to find purpose and power. I promise you this, the power of God is going to be released upon the millennials and the, the, the Gen X people and all that. And they're going to really show us what it means to be a bold and brave servant of the Most High God. All right. Anything else? We've got to get out of here. Good Lord. The little children, I, they're up there probably, you know, they may have the teachers held hostage by now. <laughs> huh. That's right. Yeah. Uh, that's right. I had a winsome way with my teachers. Yeah. I'd be so winsome, the next thing I know, I'd be sitting out in the hall <laughs> doing this. <laughs> you know. Oh, man. Teachers. Miss Ellis, I told you about her. She was our drama teacher. She's about the size of my little finger. And I took drama because all the girls were there. And uh, that's when the Brownsburg had a lot of money, and they because of all, and they built a big theater with the seats going up like that. And they had automated uh, curtains you could run with a machine, about 50 feet off the ground. 
And Miss Ellis would scream, drama, drama, project, project. I go, shucks, this ain't drama. I'm going to give them some drama. I climbed up a catwalk there about 45 feet, and I'd watched a television program about how you pack parachutes to keep them from tangling. So I thought, I'm going to pack the curtain like the parachute, and I'm going to run down the thing, and I'm leaping out across that way. So have you ever done something that worked better than you thought? I'm up there, and I have my parachute packed, and I got my arm like that so it has to feed out. And I run down this catwalk, and I scream something like, Geronimo, or some crazy thing. And I let her fly. And I swing out this way, and the curtain's feet, and it goes all the way out across the seats like that and makes a, a U-turn and comes back. And so help me God, I landed on the platform and pressed across just like that on my feet. Looked like Peter Pan, man. <laughs> if I'd had spandex, I'd have been in the movies. But anyway, Miss Ellis, she goes nuts. She has a, a psychotic breakdown. <laughs> She's screaming like, oh, 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 Lord. Carries me to the principal, high school principal, Mr. Riley, H.H. H. Riley. He looked like an undertaker. He wore a gray suit and big old black rimmed glasses, and he lurched across his desk. She carried me there, and she's still, ah, ah, he, he, he endangered the whole class. I said something like, shucks, I'm the only guy in danger. I'm the one 45 feet off the floor. But anyway, she's screaming. Finally, the principal puts her out in the hall. And I would read one of those books that you could reverse somebody's opinion. And, if, and so I thought, I'm going to pull that on. Mr. Riley. So Mr. Riley, I was a good football player. Mr. Riley said, Bobby, Bobby, I've got to do something. And I couldn't take a single point off of any grade I had. You know what I mean? I'm sub, you know. And so I knew he wouldn't expel me because football, Friday night football. And so I, I was going to pull this on, so I changed my voice. And there's he. I said, well, yes, sir, I see, I see what a predicament I put you in. Yes, sir. I said, now, uh, if, I, if I was you, um, here's what I would do. I would give me corporal punishment. See, that's when he's supposed to see my remorse and understand that I already understand that, you know, I needed to be corrected. But that ain't how it worked. He said, brilliant idea. Get up, take everything out of your pocket and bend over the desk. So I emptied my pocket and he pulled out a paddle. It's a piece of plyboard about that high and about that long with handholds cut in it and holes up there. That's corporal punishment back then. I've been over the desk. I got 17 of the hardest licks you could hit a guy. Now, I don't remember a whole bunch of things that happened at school. I remember that. <laughs> but Miss Ellis, the screamer, she wrote my yearbook. Here's what she wrote in my yearbook. You ready? It's your fault I had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> that's, what, that's what she said. Now, you know, I'm probably guilty, you know, but she had a nervous breakdown anyway, but signed my book. See, I, I want you to start enjoying yourself, okay? <laughs> Y'all don't remember Ed Sullivan, do you? He had a, he'd have a comedian, he'd paint his, uh, and put eyes here and talk to himself. It's okay. Sometimes you just need to get in the mirror and say, it's all right. <laughs> Instead of looking at all the stuff, just enjoy yourself. You ought to say, wow, I'm really something. See, there's not another human being on the planet like you. Amen. You're one in 7.6 billion people. That's purpose, isn't it? Amen. Nobody like you. Well, we've got to get out of here. Uh, Shayon will be here after a while, won't he? I said, he's, he's a great guy. Uh, I'd love to hear his message, and I'm thankful for his stance for the kingdom of God and the people of God. But anyway, uh, I want you to realize this. God says a fresh start's coming, and so like we told you last night, don't let the pains of the past keep you from embracing the victories of the future. What we've got to do is we've got to put our past in his hands. We've got to learn how to cast all of our care upon him because he cares for us. Casting our care upon him. See, Sunday after Sunday, people will come to a meeting, they'll get on there, and they'll 
crying, and then they pick their problems back up and carry them back. No, we've got to learn how to cast. Cast our care upon the Lord. Turn loose of them, okay? Don't pack them back. Because God said he's a very present help. And he says, come to me, all you that labor and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. I'm meek and lowly. You will find what? Rest for your souls. Now, here's what the Bible said. Jesus speaking said, if you look at all the chaos going on out there, uh, men's hearts failing them for the things they see coming upon the earth. But if you look higher, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is focused on the Lord. Stay focused on him. It'll drown out all the drums of the world. Won't it? Mm-hmm. Okay, we got to go. Now, oh, I am signing books again. And we've had miracles happen at the book table. Here's one. Uh, a lady, uh, she was rather proper. You know, she was, uh, and anyway, she's talked like uh, I saw it. I saw it. Cause, so she came up to the book table, and the Lord said, get her to make a doodle, and I'll draw something out of it. I said, ma'am, if it's okay with you, if you'll make a doodle, I'll draw you something out of it. She said, quite odd. That's what she says. <laughs> quite odd. I go, make a doodle. She said, okay. So I gave her a pen. She made a doodle like that. And in her doodle, I saw a Chinese person. So I drew a Chinese hat and a Chinese person out of the doodle she had here. And I signed my name to it, signed the date that I drew the doodle. And uh, she was just kind of, okay. And so she goes off. Maybe two months later, maybe three, she comes, the same woman comes to the book table again. And she said, guess what? I said, what? She pulled out the doodle I did, and she carried it to a real artist. And the artist had drawn the Chinese person's face. Then she reached down in her purse and pulled out a letter from Dennis Balcom, and he had accepted her as a missionary to China. And that's what I told her when I drew the doodle. I said, one day you'll be a missionary in China. And Dennis Balcom at that, at that time ran all the missionary things out, out of China, and, and he had accepted her as a missionary. You think, wow. Christ, at the book table, out of a little doodle. See? God knows how to make a mark in your life. And so uh, I'll, I'll write you a verse if you, if you and sign your book. I might draw something for you. I drew somebody a happy Texican last night, yesterday, whenever it was, sometimes this week. You doing well? Your name volunteer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. I, I got a friend that he calls people's name. I said, Sean, if they don't know their name, they might need more help than that. You know what I mean? If they're sitting going, who am I? You know, you know understand that? I like to tell people their future. I'll tell you your future, straight out of the Bible. Your future is filled with bright hope. That's Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, your future is filled with bright hope. We need to hang on to hope, don't you think? Yes. It says, let us not grow weary in well-doing. We'll what? Reap if we faint not. Okay? We've got to get out of here. Okay? Going to be all right. That's right. Don't you think? Yes, it is. It is. God's in this room right now healing people of blood disorder. So if you have some kind of disorder in your body with your blood, if you'll stand on your feet, the Lord Jesus will heal you. And uh, so if you've got uh, leukemia, if you've got anything, here's some with blood disorders. God said he's in the room healing. And I, he said, uh, go to the doctors and get them to check you out and tell the doctor before he checks you out, my bones have waxed fat. Okay? My bones have waxed fat. That's where your healing will come from. And so he's healing blood disorder. Okay, now don't, don't go to the doctor, tell him what's happening, and uh, uh, he'll take you off the medication, okay? Because you're going to be totally healed. The doctors will say, why well, your numbers are perfect. Say it, why well, my numbers are perfect. Okay, because my bones have waxed fat. That's in, the, there's, that's in the Bible, about your bones waxing fat. But that's good, okay? All right, all right. So, see, that was fun. You say, well, are you sure it's going to happen? The, the, the Bible said the word that goes out of my mouth will not come back to me, boy. It will accomplish the purpose for which I send it. And, and God will. Uh, he, I've seen him get people up out of comas, off of life support systems. I was in a meeting the other day, and God said, tell them I'm here taking metal out of people's body. I said, God said he's here taking metal out of people's body. A guy stood up right, right before you're seated, stood up, stuck his arm out like this. And the best thing I can describe it, you know what mercury looks like? It's in thermometers. Yeah. This silver looking stuff with 
build right here and drop, drop to the floor. Plum, 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 plum. I mean, a big puddle of this came out of his arm. So I said, tell me what's the deal. He said, I crushed my arm in a motorcycle wreck. He said, they put titanium rods and screws and bolts and stuff in there. I said, go back to the doctor and get them to x-ray it. And so the, 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 the bones were completely healed, no metal left in it. So I told the story, and this another guy runs up there and he said, fill up my arm. I touched his arm. It's so hot I couldn't hold my hand there. So I didn't see any metal come out of it, but I think God was doing something to get him ready to do that. But God can take metal out of your body, can he? Yep. Yes, he can. he can. He can do anything. Nothing's too hard for God. Genesis 18, 14. Is there anything too difficult for God? Job 42, 2 says, God, I know anything you set your heart and your hand to do cannot be stopped or stalemated. He can do anything, can he? Yep. That's true. He had the audacity to name himself El Shaddai, the God that's more than you what? Ever have need of. Boy. That's neat, isn't it? Well, we got to go. <laughs> Let's see if there's anything that... Uh, I see the, some families that are fragmented are about to be put back together. That'll be good. You can't do it, but God will do it for you. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix fragmented families and bring families back together. And you will truly have a family reunion, okay? And you'll fall back in love with your your family, okay? And your family will fall back in love with you. That'll be a good thing. Uh, the devil loves to divide. A house divided can't stand. A family divided is fragmented. But God said, I'm going to cause people to have a genuine Holy Spirit inspired family reunion. All right? Some of you will get calls from runaway kids that have said, I'm never coming back to your house. And they'll call you and ask can I come home? And you'll be, they'll be like the prodigal son that wasted his living. You remember that? And he said, my father has servants living better than I am. And so uh, expect a phone call from those that have barged out. But don't ever leave the door bolted. You know what I mean? Do what the father said. He ran and fell on the son's neck and what? Began to kiss him said, this is my son that was dead, but he's alive forevermore now. And so some, some of your kids are going to come back, okay? That'll be good. We've seen it happen over and over. And Yeah. All right, well, let's pray. Say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. I, thank I thank you that you do what you say you'll do. You tell me who I am. Help me right now to start believing that I am who you say I am. In Jesus' mighty name. Jesus mighty name. Amen. Amen. I want to tell you one story and then I'm through. I'm driving down the road in my truck and the Lord said to me, Bobby, I want you to pull off to the side of the road down here and pull up to the fence. And I said, okay, you want me to pull over at this gap? And, and he said, yes. I said, why? And he said, because... The cows want to speak to you. I said, what? You want me to pull over because the cows want to speak to me? He said, yes. Now, I've been in this long enough to know obedience is better than understanding. I turned my blinker on, pulled into a gap. This is, and there's cows out there, maybe 100 of them, maybe 80. And they're maybe 400 yards away, way out in this field. And I, I said, okay, I'm, go, I'm pulled over here. And so most of the time the cows will run because they think they're going to get fed. But here, here comes the cows. They're running full gallop. And I'm standing by the fence watching them. They run and they run and they run. And the Lord said, I want you to focus on their eyes. I'm looking at these uh, cows' eyes. I have never seen anything like it in my whole life. They're running full blast towards the fence. And they're looking at me. And... Uh, I have never seen such uh, adoration in my life out of any eyes. And they start communicating with me. And here's what they said. You ready? They said, it's you. It's you. It's finally you. And I'm standing there and uh, looking at those cows. You've n I've never seen any kind of a expectation like the eyes of these animals. And they screamed, it's you, it's you, it's finally you. And I said, God... 
What does those cows know about me that I don't know about myself? They said, he said, they know more about the timing of God. See, it's you, it's you, it's finally you. Your Bible said the whole creation is groaning and travailing, wanting us to step into our true identity as the manifested sons of God. So that's what those cows were saying. It's you, it's you, it's finally you. And so I'm telling you, the whole creation is wanting us to get into our proper place of revealing the Lamb of God because we're sons and daughters of God. All right, so it's you, it's you, it's finally you. Oh, that's the first time I've ever told it without having to cry. It, it turned me inside out. I'm telling you, this thing is a way further down the road than what we think. I'm talking about the universe and the world. Okay? Uh, we better not be shalant about it. These are precious days. Redeeming the time. Making full use of every moment. Snatching up, buying up every opportunity because the days are evil. All right. I'm out of here. Where are we going? Today?